In this video, we will discuss slightly more elaborate application of Jordan's lemma. The integral is as follows. From 0 to plus infinity, cosine of ax minus cosine of bx over x squared dx. The first peculiarity we should pay attention to is the behavior of our integrand in the origin. Indeed, we see that it may contain singularity due to x squared smallness in the denominator. So, to explore the behavior of the integrand near the origin, let us tailor expand the denominator of the integrand. And after some cancellation, we immediately obtain b squared minus a squared times x squared over 2. And we see that the singular x squared in denominator is compensated by the same x squared in denominator. And overall, the integrand is regular at the origin. Therefore, our integral is well defined and we may continue. We see that to some extent, it is a reminiscent of our previous integral. It is taking over the same semi-infinite integration domain. And the integrand itself contains only cosine functions instead of suitable exponentials. So to get rid of these issues, we employ the same algebra as in the previous example. We decompose our cosine functions into the combination of exponentials and then change the integration variables in the exponential with wrong increments. I don't want to reproduce this elementary algebra here, but what you should obtain in less than a minute is the following integral from minus infinity to infinity of one half e to i a x minus e to i b x over x squared dx. It seems everything is fine, but in reality we already have a problem here. And the problem is that our integrand now is singular at the origin. To see this, let us perform the same Taylor expansion at the origin of the denominator. This time, however, we'll obtain i a minus b time x. So when divided over x squared, we'll obtain 1 over x singularity, the first order pole, right on the integration contour. And of course, the integration contour can't go right through the singularity. It's simply unacceptable in complex analysis. So let us brood a little bit on how things came to this. The problem, of course, is our change of variables. Somehow, this change destroyed the initially convergent structure of our integral. And there is nothing we can do about it. So how would we circumvent this difficulty? As you probably understand by now, the problem is caused by the behavior of our function at the origin. So to get rid of this difficulty, let us consider a slightly modified integral. Instead of integrating from 0 to plus infinity, let us consider the integral taking from some infinitesimal positive number epsilon to plus infinity. And then we'll set epsilon to be equal to 0 at the end of our calculation. So here is our new integral. Now we use the same algebra and turn our integral into a form suitable for application for Jordan's lemma. But this time, however, we will not be able to obtain the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of difference of two exponentials. Rather, we will obtain two separate integrals from minus infinity to minus epsilon and from epsilon to plus infinity of the same integrand. So this way there is no problem with singularity, but there is a trade-off. Now we have two separate integrals instead of one. And in mathematics there is a special name for this combination of integrals. It is called a principal value integration and is denoted as integral with dash sign. What it means is that we take the integral of some function along some contour and whenever the contour meets a singularity of the integrand, it is split and offset by infinitesimal distance to the left and to the right of the singularity. And this procedure is called the integration in the sense of a principal value. But now what, you may ask? We reduce our original integral to a more suitable form, but over a split contour. And what we were aiming at is a closed contour, not the split one. So what shall we do now? Well, now we will close our contour. We'll connect our separate pieces at the origin with infinitesimal upper or lower semicircle. It's up to us to choose, but I choose upper semicircle, for the reason which will hopefully be clear to you in a couple of minutes. Then I'll connect two infinite edges of this contour by this time infinite upper semicircle, keeping in mind the application of Jordan's lemma. Now we'll promote our integrand into a complex plane and denote it as f of z. And consider a closed contour integral. Of course, this integral consists of our principal value integral, which is nothing but our initial integral, plus the integral along infinitesimal upper semicircle, and plus the integral along the upper 
infinite semicircle, CR. Due to Jordan's lemma, this infinite semicircular integral tends to zero, and the radius of the circle tends to infinity. Because it's a combination of two exponential with positive increments, a and b, and pre-exponential function g of z, which is equal to 1 over z squared, tends to zero uniformly with respect to the argument of the complex number. Now the closed contour integral itself. From residual theorem, it should be equal to 2 pi i times the sum of the residues. But there are no poles inside this contour, our function is analytic in it. So this closed contour integral is in fact equal to zero. So miraculously, our principal value integral is now equal to minus the integral along this infinitesimal semicircle at the origin. And this is from my point of view, is a charm of complex analysis. We started with a complicated integral from zero to plus infinity, and we reduced it to an integral along some infinitesimal circle. And of course this integral is way easier to compute, because we don't need the full function to do this, but just its Taylor series near the origin. So let us perform the Taylor expansion for our f of z function. The first term in the denominator was already obtained by us. It's i a minus b z over z squared and so on. So our first term in the Laurent expansion of our function is i times a minus b over z and plus some regular terms. Now why don't I write these regular terms? Well, that's because when we integrate along this infinitesimal circle, they will vanish as the radius of the circle tends to zero. This way we only need singular terms, and there is only one of them, and it's what is written here. Now let's plug in this expansion into our integral, and we'll obtain minus i a minus b over 2 times the integral dz over z. And we introduce the standard parameterization, z equals epsilon times e to i phi, and therefore dz over z is simply i d phi. And since phi changes from pi to zero, this integral is equal to minus i pi. So in the end, for our semicircular integral, we obtain the answer, which is a minus b times pi by two. And that's it. Our principal value integral is now expressed as b minus a times pi by two, which is nothing but our initial integral. And the answer is luckily independent of epsilon. So we may set epsilon equal to zero and recover our original integral. And that completes our example. In our next video, we'll consider a slightly more interesting example of principal value integration.